Now, can I then uh, quickly move on to uh, the evidence? Uh, we are, I think, uh, unique in this case uh, for having put in a witness statement concerning evidence about how the power in question is actually exercised, and you'll see that in uh, Sir John's statement. Uh, and we say it's significant for two reasons. First, because it constitutes the unchallenged evidence of a former prime minister and long-serving parliamentarian as to what the purpose, uh, the power uh, of prorogation serves, how it's generally exercised, and what considerations might have a bearing on its use, in particular as to the period of the prorogation. Secondly, because it contains clear and unambiguous, uh, a clear and unambiguous allegation in evidence and supported by evidence that the reasons set out in the documents put before the court by the Prime Minister can't be true and complete reasons for the decision. Now, see, for example, in the introductory section of the statement at paragraph 5, just the last few lines, uh, where Sir John says the inescapable inference to be drawn is that the prorogation is to prevent Parliament from exercising its right to disagree with the government and to legislate as it sees fit. Now, this is important, we say, because of the discussion yesterday as to whether there is an expectation in judicial review proceedings that the decision-maker will explain the reasons for the decision in evidence. Now, whether there is or is not room for doubt about whether such evidence is to be expected in the ordinary court I submit that it was more or less accepted by my learned friend Sir James Eady on behalf of the Prime Minister that where an allegation of this kind has been made, it would be normal uh, for there at least to be some kind of witness statement in response. And in this case, we've made a direct allegation in evidence that the reasons stated in the documents don't stack up. And there's been no witness statement in response and no reason, real reason provided why not. Let me then quickly move on to a brief overview of the statement. In uh, his statement, Sir John explains at paragraphs 9 and 10 that prorogation in our constitution is usually routine. I think my uh, Mr. Fordham used the word mundane. And in practice, leaves the Queen with no discretion. And indeed, the leader of the House, Mr. Rees Mogg, uh, said as much, I think, in an interview. At paragraph 12 of uh, the major statement, he addresses the significance of the distinction between prorogation, adjournment, recess, and dissolution. And he draws from the Institute Government uh, briefing paper as well. At paragraphs 18 to 24, and particularly at paragraph 23, he identifies three main reasons which have been put forward in the government's documents and explains why each of them is a perfectly sensible reason for proroguing, but no reason at all for proroguing for five weeks, let alone for five critical weeks in a period in which time is of the essence. Then we go to uh, paragraph 26 onwards, so the second half of the statement, uh, where Sir John identifies various pieces of evidence which suggest that the decision was in fact motivated to a material extent by a desire to prevent Parliament from interfering with the Prime Minister's policies during that critical period. Prorogation, we say, is different from dissolution. In his submissions, my learned friend Sir James relied on the dissolution of Parliament as what he called a core example of a prerogative power that was considered before the uh, Fixed Term Parliaments Act to be entirely non-justiciable. He submitted that there was no material difference between prorogation and dissolution, so that even though there is no authority suggesting that the power of prorogation is non justiciable, the same should apply. My lords, my ladies, there is a world of difference uh, between the two. Put simply, dissolution overrides Parliament in favour of the electorate, and prorogation overrides Parliament in favour of the executive. It's the direction of travel point. Uh, and this was a point uh, brought up in questioning by my Lord, Lord Hodge, and my Lord, Lord Kerr. The power of dissolution allows Parliament to renew its mandate from the electorate. It brings the state in contact with the ultimate source of democratic legitimacy. 
there are citations from Dicey, which I won't go to, uh, to support that. But prorogation, by contrast, transfers power in the other direction, not closer to the source of democratic legitimacy, but further away. So from the perspective of a principle of parliamentary sovereignty, first, a power of dissolution necessarily involves an interference with parliament, but the principal effect of that interference is to ensure that the political basis for parliamentary sovereignty remains intact. A power of prorogation, of course, also involves an interference with parliament, but it's a matter purely between the organs of the state. There's no reason, we say, why it should be treated as unreviewable simply because the power of dissolution was once not reviewable. Now may I quickly what, look what, at... What principle is there for not reviewing the uh, dissolution? What principle? Well, it's now dealt with by, by statute. Yeah. Uh, but but, uh, the, the, but the, the, the authorities which spoke of this in the past <coughs> uh, predated the fixed-term Parliament Act. That, I suspect, is because there was, uh, in the Victorian era and before, uh, a much greater actual respect, as opposed to fictional politeness, played to the role of the sovereign in person, as opposed to the enshrined of parliament or the executive uh, through the administration. You think it's a, a, a historical hangover, then, rather than, a, rather than mean, a principle? Are, in some senses, and I don't wish to be uh, impertinent, but a lot of how our constitution has developed over time is a series of fudges. Arrangements are made which are politically convenient. Uh, and the uh, example that my Lord has, has just addressed to me is, is, I suspect, one of those. We exercise through necessary polite fictions in order to enable our constitution to develop and to work. Let me, if I may, come on to permissible purposes. Uh, the defendant, the Prime Minister, in his submissions repeatedly poses the question, how is this court to determine what is permissible and what is impermissible? Uh, he submits that the decision to prorogue inevitably involves a degree of politics, uh, at least as to timing, and how is the court to decide what is good or bad political reasoning? Uh, in our submission, that entirely misses the point. The question is not whether the motive is political or whether it's a good political or a bad political uh, reason, but whether the prorogation contravenes a legal principle. Now, as we said in our first written submission at paragraph 7, in the case of a statutory power, the most obvious way of determining which purposes are legitimate uh, or illegitimate is to consult the statute. But the statute, or a statute, isn't the only source of legal rules. There are some legal principles which we submit are sufficiently important that they're properly to be regarded as governing the purposes for which any power, statutory or otherwise, may be exercised. And parliamentary sovereignty is one such principle. It requires no specific statutory underpinning. It's inherent in the constitutional order. Now, my learned friend Sir James submitted yesterday that parliamentary sovereignty was limited, in his words, to the principle uh, that it is an unduly narrow, uh, to the principle that parliament can make or unmake uh, its own laws. But we say that is an unduly narrow formulation. But in any event, it's, it's enough to make the point because parliament cannot make or unmake laws if it isn't allowed to sit. But parliament doesn't only uh, exercise its sovereignty through uh, legislation. It exercises it through uh, summoning papers and people. It exercises its, uh, its sovereignty through holding the government to account on the floor of the Houses of Parliament. Uh, it even uh, holds uh, its sovereignty by uh, the power of contempt, uh, holding people in contempt of Parliament. You'll remember the Sir John Juna case in 1957 where he appeared at the bar of the House. You may also remember that in 2016, two newspaper executives involved in the phone hacking scandal were held in contempt of court for telling untruths to a parliamentary committee. And you will remember in March of this year that Mr. Dominic Cummings uh, was held in contempt of parliament for failing to come before the uh, culture meetings for the committee. Now, the relevant question we submit is the power being exercised in a way which materially impedes Parliament's uh, ability to discharge its functions in the way that it considers important or appropriate. Now, my learned friend Sir James submits that any prerogation involves an interference with Parliament's ability to discharge its functions. But, of course, that's true 
but is it a material interference? That's the question that we need to think about. If it's uh, for a very short period, as modern prorogations have been, well, then there is no material interference. Uh, if it comes at a time when there is no particularly pressing legislative business, for example, no looming and time-crucial uh, critical deadline outside Parliament's control, uh, anything which Parliament may wish to do during the period of prorogation can equally be done in the new session, uh, if necessary, with retrospective effect, so that it's prevented from acting uh, in the short term. But ultimately, it can still do whatever it wishes to do. Now, my lords, uh, my ladies, Sir James submitted that this issue would involve the court in a series of impossible questions. How long is too long? What's reasonable and what's unreasonable? Now, one could make the same submissions about other areas of the law, uh, of negligence, the concept of proportionality, the defense of honest opinion, and so on. The law recognizes standards which it may not be possible to lay out mechanically in the abstract in a way which covers all possible permutations, but which it is possible to apply to a given case. Can I then quickly turn to uh, political motives? The defendant has relied on two examples of prorogations which it said were done for political gain and which therefore illustrate that prorogation for political gain is a legitimate exercise of the power. He cites the case in 1948 uh, when there were three sessions in quick succession in, in order to uh, amend the 1911 Parliament Act uh, into the, what became the 1949 Act. Well, as my lady, Lady Hale, and I think Lady Arden also commented, uh, that was legislation passed in order to facilitate the work of the democratically elected House. And it had the overwhelming support of that House, uh, as we say in our written submissions at paragraph two uh, in the second set of submissions. Now, Sir James said, of course, well, that's a frustration of Parliament as a whole. Wrong. It wasn't. It was in exact compliance with the 1911 Act. Uh, the Parliament Act 1911 provided that the bill had to be passed in three successive sessions within two years. Uh, and that's precisely what the uh, Parliament in 1948 did. So nothing done in 48 frustrated the will of the House of Lords. And as I say, it was very much in accordance with the will of the Commons. The second, the second example, uh, referred to in a tweet by Nikki de Costa in July, just before she came into government, about a fortnight, 10 days, 14 days before she came to government, uh, uh, but touched upon gently by uh, my learned friend Sir James, is the prorogation in 1997 at the end of the John Major Parliament. Uh, and it was suggested that he had uh, prorogued for base political reasons wrong, uh, and I, I haven't got time to take you to the facts of it, but if, if, you're, if the court would look at the documents which are uh, appended to his statement, you will find uh, a letter from Lord Heseltine to the Times the other day, which completely cuts that off, it uh, destroys the, the, the factual basis of that. But if anything, the fact that the allegation was made and that the prorogation for that alleged reason was controversial suggests that it would have been regarded as an impermissible use of the power. In other words, we say it runs entirely contrary to Sir James's uh, submissions. Uh, why should the court stop the prorogation when Parliament has an opportunity to do what it wants? Uh, Sir James has submitted that there's no need for the courts to intervene uh, because the events relating to the Ben Bill uh, have shown that it can legislate quickly when it wants to. Now, as my Lord Lord Sales has already made the point that there is only so much time available. But there are two further reasons we submit why that is no answer. First, the reason that there are processes for considering and developing legislation in both houses is because legislation generally benefits from scrutiny. Legislating in a hurry leads to the old cliche, what is the law that Parliament passes most often in a hurry? The law of the unintended consequence. Second, uh, it's just uh, not the amount of time available, but when that, when that time is. Uh, events may develop between now and the 14th of October. Parliament may wish to legislate in early October in a way that it couldn't have foreseen in late August. On a similar note, uh, uh, my learned friend Lord Keane submitted that the courts shouldn't step in where Parliament could have prevented the prorogation but didn't do so. Well, it's not at all obvious, uh, we say, that Parliament 
would have been able to prevent the prorogation. First, there is the requirement for Queen's consent. We've seen that from Erskine and May, uh, and the submissions of my learned friend, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, that could have been uh, withheld. And secondly, even if the Queen's consent was required, Parliament would, could simply have been prorogued before any bill that sought to prevent it became law. The logic of the justiciability analysis is that the courts would have nothing to say about that situation, despite it being an obvious frustration of Parliament's will. I think it was also suggested by my Lord, Lord Carnworth, <coughs> that Parliament could have passed a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister, a, a suggestion taken up by my learned friend. But that wouldn't actually have addressed the vice uh, of the prorogation, and probably would have made matters worse. First of all, we would have lost, Parliament would have lost, up to 14 days in deciding whether uh, another person uh, could form an administration. Uh, or it could have led to uh, the dissolution of Parliament, in which case the whole thing uh, would have had to start again. Time and the risk of wasting time at a time when time is a very, very scarce resource is something that I think uh, this court should take account of. Now, my Lord, Lord Wilson yesterday asked the stark question, well, if, if we can't control what's going on, who can? Uh, and it seems to me that these are, and I think my Lord Lord Sales also uh, uh, dealt with the question of uh, the danger of politicizing the, the Queen. These points are aspects, we submit, of a broader submission that this court shouldn't intervene in decisions to prorogue because they involve matters of politics. Now, the immediate and obvious response to that is that the reason the courts leave political matters alone is because they're subject to political control and there can be no political control of a decision to prorogue if the body that would exercise that control has been prevented from acting. We've identified in our written submission several examples of exercises of the power of prorogation which would frustrate political control. But in answer to that point, Sir James relies on two other possible types of control. First of all, practical constraints. He, he talks of the need to vote money uh, to pass the Armed Forces Act. Uh, but as we point out in our second written submissions at paragraph 7, those controls will be the fundamental obstacle that they depend for their effectiveness on the Prime Minister placing a higher authority on the orderly running of the country than on the achievement of his political goals. All it would take is a Prime Minister who is happy to see funding for public services lapse or for the Armed Forces Act to expire in order to achieve his goals and the controls would be useless. And we submit it would be a strange constitution that protected against a conscientious executive, but not against a reckless one. Secondly, the prospect of the sovereign's ability to refuse consent to a prorogation. The short answer to this point is this. If the courts should not interfere because the matter is too intensely political, that's all the more reason why it would be wrong for the sovereign to be required to step in. I think that's a Point. Now, the reasons uh, that uh, the government have given in this case, uh, as we, I've mentioned, uh, Sir John's evidence explains the factors relevant to the decision to prorogue and why the reasons in the documents put forward by the government explain why there should be a prorogation, but they don't in any way, in any way, address the reasons why it must be for five weeks. Now, there are two things which are most obviously missing from the 15th of August to cost a briefing paper to the Prime Minister. First, uh, while there's an attempt to explain why the 14th of October would be an appropriate day for a Queen's speech, and therefore an appropriate date for the session to end, uh, it, uh, for the prorogation to end, there's no attempt at all to explain why early September would be an appropriate date for the prorogation to begin, a point uh, drawn out by Lord Kerr yesterday. The logic of the briefing paper is equally consistent with a decision to prorogue on the Friday before. The inference must be that there must be some other factor which meant that the decision maker wanted the prorogation to begin much earlier. Secondly, the total absence of any suggestion uh, that it was recognized that the prorogation might be controversial. Now taken in isolation, that might not be surprising, but it's necessary to consider the author as my Lord, Lord Wilson pointed out on the first day of this hearing, this is a person who a few weeks before writing this briefing paper, which gives the impression that the decision was entirely logistical, was writing in the Spectator on the 29th of June, 
again, that is in your papers, uh, about the possibility of a prime minister running down the clock in the lead up to the mid-October European Union summit and describing prorogation as a nuclear option. For our part, we don't buy the suggestion from my learned friend, Lord Keane, that the woman who wrote the article in late June had a different character or mental state to the woman who wrote the briefing paper and who was closely advising the Prime Minister uh, once he had taken office. Let me now quickly deal with the... Well, you, you are more or less out of time. I am. I think on my... I've got two minutes to go. Well, yes, but you started well, early. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> However, we might, I think, indulge you with your two Would minutes. Would you mind? I'd yes. be very, very grateful. Um, <laughs> Let me t I really am on the, my last uh, few submissions dealing with inferences. Um, we say there is uh, credible prima facie evidence that the reasons in the documents aren't the true and complete reasons. There's been no evidence uh, adduced to rebut that evidence. There's been repeated requests for such evidence or for an explanation uh, of why it hasn't been provided at the highest levels, including in questions uh, to the government and the Prime Minister in the Commons. In those circumstances, it would, we submit, be very difficult not to infer that the reason is that any evidence which could be given would be highly adverse to the Prime Minister's case. That the inference which in any normal circumstances would be uh, readily uh, drawn. We submit that that inference is all the more justifiable uh, in these circumstances. That's to say where uh, there is recent evidence of the Downing Street Press Office having been uh, misleading in its announcements. Give the example in our first submissions at paragraphs 20 and 21 of these. Uh, the 24th of August 2019, in response to reports that the Prime Minister was considering prorogation, a spokesman said that the claim that the government is considering proroguing Parliament in September to stop MPs debating Brexit is entirely false. A, a, a quotation drawn attention to by Lord Hodge yesterday. Of course, that's technically consistent with the Prime Minister's case, but as a denial to the reports that prorogation was being considered, it's not the whole truth. It's what we used to call swearing by the card. Uh, and whatever its intent, its effect was plainly to mislead. We know that because it misled even a member of the Cabinet, the uh, Culture Secretary. Uh, but we also know, of course, that the day after that, the Defence Secretary gave the game away, and you have the interview uh, 